It's blown a hooli, as they say. This is the Lizard Peninsula, one of the most ruggedly beautiful coastlines in the country. It's well known for a crazy beautiful rock called Serpentine. And believe it or not, this is also the birthplace of a technology that has changed all of our lives. I can't wait to get stuck in. I might need a hairband, though. <laughs> The best way to see the true landscape of Cornwall and Devon is on foot. Britain is a walker's paradise, and these two counties are packed with beautiful walks. Just another epic cove in Cornwall. Going to the places only your walking boots can take you. You've got to follow the wonderful curves of the river. It just makes my heart sing. I'm with you. From the subtropics of the Isles of Scilly, to the magical woods of Helford. Little Hansel and Gretel style cottage. And en route, I'll be seeking out the country's most unforgettable views. This is thought to be the oldest surviving beacon in the British Isles. Experiencing everything Cornwall and Devon can throw at me. Pretty impressive. He didn't fall off! And meeting the people. It is an honour to be with the godmother of Cornish pasties. That make Cornwall and Devon so unique. So walk with me. It's going to be an adventure you'll never forget. This is the most secluded part of the Cornish coast. A peninsula that feels almost like a wild island, steeped in the traditions that make Cornwall, well, Cornwall. Today's seven and a half mile route starts at Kynance Cove. I'll then hike east to the Lizard Village. From there, I'll make my way down to Lizard Point before finishing off at Cadgewith. Kynance Cove is known for its beguiling beauty and is one of the most photographed beaches in Cornwall. It's where this walk starts, but it's not just the beach that I'm here to see. Hi, Lisbeth. Hi. Well, Hello. it's certainly living up to its reputation. It's wild and wonderful here, <laughs> yeah, isn't it? For sure. For sure. Gorgeousness, though. Definitely. Yeah, uh, it's a stunning spot. Gulping in the fresh air. <laughs> Are you one of those people that, um, that does the wild swimming? Oh, no, you're not, no, you're no. not that crazy. Oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> Cornish blogger and nature lover Elizabeth is here to help me spot a special resident there's a little bird that I think most people will know the name of, but probably haven't seen them in the flesh, the chuff. I always think like chuffs and tits, everybody knows their names, but, but, they, but they don't know what they are. But this is the, the area of the chuff, isn't it? Yes, yeah, and the, and the Cornish are really proud of our national bird. Um, it's on our coat of arms, and we're always uh, delighted to see them. But the really distinctive thing about them is this long, um, sort of curved, bright red beak, and they've got bright red feet as well. And so. this is a perfect day for them, because they actually like windy days, don't they? Because they like to sort of dart around. Yeah, we yeah. might see them. Hopefully. Fingers yeah, crossed. Fingers We've got crossed. some sunshine. Look at that. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that today. <laughs> Now, we know that bird life is in trouble, yeah. but there is a mini success story here about the chuff, yeah. isn't there? Yeah, there is. They did die out almost completely, and by about 1970, they were completely gone. And then in about 2001, mm. um, they just suddenly reappeared, and they were wi a wild uh, pair from Ireland came and, and actually started nesting somewhere near Cape Cornwall. This year, from what I understand, there's 23 pairs here mm. on the coast of Cornwall. Very lovely. Look, there they are as well. Look. Yeah, yeah, as if by magic. There they go. Yes. Oh, they love all that, that flat grass because they're always looking for the bugs and the grubs and obviously it's easier for them to find. And they've got those long they're beaks, aren't they? The little curvy yeah, beaks, so yeah. perfect. For digging stuff out. And actually the Cornish name for them is, is digger. Is it? Yeah. Well, we've seen a chuff, so I'm happy. There you oh, go. Chuff. Chuff with my chuff spot over there. <laughs> Elizabeth, it's been such a treat to meet you. Thank Take you. Take care. <laughs> Cheers, bye. Next, my walk will take me east along the coast for one mile before cutting inland to Lizard Village. Oh, the sound of the waves. That is always just a joy. A little bit of sunshine. Oh, that is welcome, because the wind is bitterly cold. And you are instantly struck by this, the wild beauty of this coastline which is going to keep me company for the rest of the walk now. And that's no bad thing.
The UK has over 11,000 miles of coastline and countless coastal walks. But what makes this walk so special is the majestic dark green and red rock that you see everywhere. It's called serpentinite, but it's known locally as just serpentine, and it's only found in a handful of places worldwide. It was pushed up over 300 million years ago when two continental plates collided. In 1846, when Queen Victoria and Prince Albert visited, they were so struck by its marble-like beauty, they had several ornaments carved from it, and it started a bit of a craze. My walk now leads me into the Lizard Village, where you'll still find traditional serpentinite craftsmen. Oh, I love a workshop. Hello, Gary. Hello. Hello, hello. I'm going to stand out of the way. There's a few bits flying off there. Gary learned his trade from his grandfather at the age of eight, and he's one of the last turners left in the village. I'm not being rude, Gary, but this does look like just a bunch of rubble. Yeah, some of it is, yeah. but that, that's the... Um... That's the raw material. Is it? Um, that's how we would get it out of the ground. So we knock it around with a hammer, find any faults, hopefully find all of them before we stick it up yeah. on the lathe and turn it to make probably a doorstop. Before Doesn't we start. look like much. No. <laughs> Just there, though. <laughs> no, no, not much colour in it yet. But... Is this the same machinery that your grandpa worked on? Yeah, yeah, most of it, yeah. It is. Lovely. Look at that. Look at the way the circles. Gary skillfully turns the stone on the lathe. So satisfying. And he uses his chisel to chip away until it's perfectly symmetrical. What's this going to be? This will just be a paperweight. A paperweight. Yeah. So yeah. this, look at that. Look at that little nubbly end. Let's be honest, you're not really blown away by that. But look, look how beautiful that is, that finished product. And it feels, I can't tell you, and that big lump a rock down there, that one. Oh, look! Fancy that jamming your door open. I do. Shame that's so heavy, I can't really steal that. Gary, you're a very talented young man. Keep it going. Well, thank oh, you for coming. nice. Really nice to see. I'll leave you to it. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. And this isn't the only Cornish tradition that people come to the village for. Now, I'm going to need some sustenance for my journey. And as Cornwall is the land of saints and pasties, I'm going to get myself a pasty because I don't think a saint is going to keep me company on any walks. Look where we are, though. Right down the end of the country. Not away from anywhere. Now, you can't get more Cornish than a pasty. The county churns out at least 120 million every year. This simple meat and vegetable pie was traditionally a worker's lunch eaten by miners, farmers and fishermen. There's a little shop here on the Lizard that has a reputation for making some of the best pasties in Cornwall. Hello, Anne. Oh, Thank hi, Julia. you. Thank you for letting me in here. Well, you're welcome. And it is an honour to be with the uh, godmother of Cornish pasties. Well, that's nice to know. Yeah. Anne is a fourth-generation pasty maker and learnt her trade from her mother. This is sort of the hub of it all, isn't it? Well, yes, the lizard is where I've been making pastas for 31 years here. Gosh, <laughs> man and boy, <laughs> yeah. as they say. Exactly. <laughs> so what is the secret? Well, uh, good ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Uh, careful attention to seasoning right. is very important. So, so what do we start with then? Right, we start with a small amount of onion. You don't overdo the onion, or you can if you really love onion. A little bit of turnip on the bottom. Right, OK. okay. Got it, OK. Uh, now a little bit of beef. So you want a little bit of meat in both ends because you don't want anyone biting into it and thinking, oh, where's the meat? No, you know, they that's want... nothing worse than no. that skimpy right, Cornish yeah, pasty. No, they think, oh, my goodness, there's no meat in this pasty. It's terrible. Oh, did I salt? No, I haven't salted. Not salt. No, no. Now, uh, um, try and aim at getting one speck deep if you can think about that. Now, it's difficult for you. You won't know how to hold that. I hold it like this. One speck deep? Yeah, I don't even know what deep. that means. One well, speck deep. Well, not a huge amount, if you Oh, OK, fine. I'll tell you what, you'd, if you do that and uh, then sprinkle it, okay, right. it might be easier for you. I love yeah. that. I love you don't even trust me to, <laughs> to pour the salt. <laughs> well, no, 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 you no, can no. just sprinkle it. It'll be that easier for you. That action takes practice. It takes OK, a years of practice. Yeah, years of practice. You can over-season, and, and that's dreadful. You want it perfectly seasoned. Right. Uh, now, is it true that back in the day, Cornish pasties used to be half sweet and half savoury? No. I no. think... No. Not, not, not in my opinion. Um, it's a shocking revelation <laughs> for lots of people. 
You won't find any Cornish pasty maker yeah. uh, actually making them. So that is a bit of an indication that, that it really isn't. it's not actually a Cornish pasty. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I didn't know. No, no, you wouldn't know. So... Uh, Oh, the fishermen don't take pasties to sea. What? No, 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 no. They take that seriously. Yeah. I thought that was the whole point. It's yeah. that it, it's it's like yeah. food on the run. It's uh -huh. parcelled up. Uh -huh. It's easy to take uh -huh. with you. You're yeah. saying fishermen don't? No, they don't. I mean, they eat pasties, of course. I might take this straight to the news, actually. Yeah, so yeah. no such yeah. thing as the savoury sweet. No, that's right. And and Cornish right. fishermen do yeah. not take Cornish pasties yeah. out to yeah. sea and never have. Yeah. And the devil's afraid to come to Cornwall because he's afraid he'll be put in a pasty. That's another well, that makes perfect yeah. sense. I get that. Absolutely. Anyway, uh, this is the classic pasty. Right, I'm missing, yeah, I'm missing... Yeah, you need potato. Some. Oh, I, oh, gosh, I yeah. definitely want potato. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Now what? Bring the edges together over the pasty yes. and press them together. Right, so in the middle you Yeah, I, I, I tend to, so... Okay. With these fingers folding inwards. Okay? I'm completely confused. Mm. So... Don't there, worry, like that. don't worry. Like that, like that. Yes, like that. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Oh. No. Fold inwards with that hand. I think I'm not. I. Don't worry about it. Even Is that it? Is that it? Yeah. Yes, okay. All yeah. oh, right, now I've got it. Yes. I just wasn't there. Once you've got it, you've got it. By Jove, I By think Jove. she's got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Have you? Look at that. Yeah, it's really, well, really, really good. I'm quite happy with a bit it's of crimping. It's absolutely lovely. It's and it has been an education. Thank you so much. It's been lovely to meet you and to come into the hub of your empire. Can I take a Cornish pasty with me, please? Of right. course you can. Thank Roger, you. Julia. Keep you lovely. Going. Keep you going for the next that six will. miles. I won't take you on a fishing boat. Oh, no. Do not. Whew. I feel exhausted after that. No time to rest, though. I'm going to be hiking to Cornwall's most southerly point. I'm in southwest Cornwall on the Lizard Peninsula, where I'm discovering the county's heritage on its most isolated coast. Leaving the Lizard Village behind me, I'm walking one mile south to Lizard Point. This is one of the warmest places in Britain. Winter is almost frost free, making it a perfect home for rich and exotic flora. This succulent covering is called Hottentot. It's actually native to South America, but it was introduced here about 100 years ago, and it's become incredibly successful. In fact, it's become a bit of a botanical bully, and it's taking over from a lot of the native species. And that's what happens when you mess with nature. But look at the shape of this. Look how perfectly symmetrical that is. It doesn't matter what crazy shapes and patterns you imagine in your mind, nature has beaten you to it. There's so much plant life here, over 600 species of flowering plants alone. But I've got to march on to my next destination, which is in sight. Hello, lizard! This is the most southerly point in Britain. There is nobody in the country right now who's as far south as I am. France is over there. Bonjour, mon ami! And incredibly, a third of the world's ships pass by here. What a spot! And around 300 metres from this point is the Lizard Lighthouse, which has provided a welcoming landfall light to vessels crossing the Atlantic for over 250 years. I'm just over four miles into this walk, and this flatter section past the lighthouse is an easy ramble to... a little wooden hut that's a big part of communication history. Now, I've been in some sheds in my time, but if I told you that what went on behind this door has changed your life, would you believe me? Hi, Anne. Hi. What a lovely little hut. It is. And completely unexpected. I know, I know. Most people walk in the cliffs are looking out at the sea and the dramatic scene out there. Yeah. And behind them is this wonderful place that you step back in time yeah. to 1901. This is where the Italian inventor, Guglielmo Marconi, made a really important discovery, as National Trust volunteer Anne explains. 
How did he end up here then in Cornwall? He was very interested in sort of physics, science side, and he'd been experimenting in the villa in Italy. Yeah. And he started to get different distances between where the sound was coming from to it being recorded somewhere else. Right. And he tried to get some support from the Italian government and people, and everyone said it was impossible. And his mother then took him to England. So he was only 22, and they got a lot of backing fr from people there. There was quite a lot of interest. So he was convinced that he could send signals over long distances? Yes, so he experimented doing short distances to start with. He set up a station in the Isle of Wight. Mm. So when he set up down here, the sole purpose was to get a signal from the Isle of Wight to here, which he achieved in January 1901. That is incredible. So 1901. I mean, we weren't sort of all talking about wireless technology until about 25 years ago. This little shack is the birthplace of wireless technology. Yeah. It's a small, significant part of communication history. Yeah. Mr. Marconi, he was a genius. I think so, yes. Can we do anything? Are we allowed to touch anything in here? Is there anything that we, we know that you know, he could do? Well, th th this is an interesting piece of equipment. So this, this is a spark gap transmitter. Of course it is. Um, so that, that you press the Morse key. Yeah. And a spark jumps between those two points. Right. And this is how he sent messages out? Yes. That's right. If you press that... Yeah. Oh, there we go! <laughs> <laughs> the electric spark okay. generates radio waves, carrying the message in Morse code. That's... Put the kettle on. Make me a cup of love. Woohoo! Oh, it's a blustery day! And passing this landmark, a former shipping signal station, means I'm on the home stretch. My final leg is just over two miles and takes me to the fishing village of Cadgeworth. Dating back to medieval times, this picturesque village owes its existence to the fishing industry. Oh, it's like cottage heaven. And one tiny fish in particular, the pilchard. Once the most lucrative catch in Cornwall, but by the 1970s, the demand for locally produced salted pilchards was all but gone. Then, around 20 years ago, Nick, with the help of the Cadgeworth fishermen, started a revival, rebranding the pilchards as Cornish sardines. So all of these lovely buildings around us, the cottage with the thatched roof, somehow would have been involved in the pilchard industry. Yeah, in, in fishing. Pilchards was the main catch that you could make big money on if you got it right. I remember speaking to a man in Evergizzi, and uh, in one night, they had had such a catch, it had paid for the house. What, paid the mortgage off? Paid the whole mortgage off. In yeah. one hit? In one night, yeah. That's not bad, is it? That's pretty good, isn't it? Oh, you don't get that anymore. Can't do that very often. No, no and you can no. pay off the mortgage in one, one job. Yeah. Tell me the Cornish story with pilchards. Pilchards have been around exporting since 1555, first exports. And it's interesting, it's the Protestant Cornish selling to the Catholic countries of Europe. And they were fished not in their hundreds of thousands, but in their millions. In their millions, yeah. What are we yeah. talking about? What would, what would, you know, give me some big number catches. The very biggest ones recorded were six million fish in St Ives. Gosh! So you can get an idea of it. If you want to compare a big year, 1871, about 18,000 tonnes caught with just rowing boats and sane boats in Cornwall. Nowadays, with all our little modern boats and we've just revived the industry, the catch is up to 8,000 tonnes. So we're nowhere, we're nowhere, nowhere near, near. No, nowhere near them yet. Must be something to do with the men and the fishing folk. Well, it's all consumption. Now we call them sardines. People like sardines. I was going to ask you, is it a pilchard or is it a sardine or is it just a Cornish sardine? Yes. The species is Sardina pilchardus. Right. So that gives you an idea. There you go. It's both. Either way, I hate to break it to you, Nick, I don't like them. They're just too fishy. Yeah, you have to have them super fresh. Yeah, so, yeah. that rancidity of the oil that makes a difference. But that's all the good so, stuff, isn't it? That's what that's what's good for your heart. Yeah. yeah. That's what makes you brainy. Well, that's obviously well, mind that. You, obviously, it's... that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you for shining a light on the pilchard world. Uh, very uh, important question before I leave you: jam first or cream first? <laughs> 
depends if you're from Devon or Cornwall, of course. Well, where, where do you go with this one? I, I always prefer to put the cream on first because I have a, quite a job trying to spread the cream on top of the jam. But I know that's the wrong way round down here. It's controversial. There we are. Don't know what people are going to say about that. Oh. The jam on top is the bloody <laughs> cream on top. <laughs> Time then for one very last Cornish treat. Well, the perfect way to end this very Cornish walk is, of course, Cornish afternoon tea. Now then, there's probably nothing more famous than these little babies, the scones with the clotted cream. Is it the cream first and then the jam, or is it the jam and then the cream? Well, in Cornwall, it is most definitely the jam first. However, I'm Greek, so I'm going to go for the other way, because to me, the cream is like butter. And then, look, perfectly spread on the scone. And then you go for your jam, dolloped on the top like that. I'm fully prepared for the hatred that uh, I might receive, but it's just the way I like it. However, I do respect the, um, the war that goes on between the two counties. So, I'm sorry. Mmm. Mmm. Come on. Mmm. To be honest, Tastes the same, doesn't it? I'm in South Devon walking the verdant Dart Valley Trail, starting in historic Totnes. One of the oldest boroughs in England. A very impressive walk. Oh, look at that! Agatha Christie bought this house in 1938. Finishing in Dartmouth. It's a good place to end up. A really good place. Help is on the way from a new unit, not that Lisa and the team have much choice. The new series of our crime drama The Bay continues tonight on ITV at 9. Next, we're back to Coronation Street 